about to Ephesians chapter 4. We, are, uh, we have been doing a series, and it's a, you know, going a little bit longer, obviously, because of just you know, sickness, but we've been doing our series on home improvement. We want to improve the house. We want to improve the family life. We want to improve those things in life, right? And so this morning, I want to talk to you, you know, about this little thing called communication. There's a little thing called communication, or as I've titled this, Let's Talk. Let's talk. And so in Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 25, and we're going to go through uh, chapter 5, verse 2. Uh, verse 25, wherefore, putting away lying, speak uh, every man truth with his neighbor, for we are uh, member, uh, members of one another. Be uh, uh, angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon, thy, upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let uh, him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good. That he, may, uh, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto, your, uh, unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and uh, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind uh, one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one, uh, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Chapter five: Be ye, uh, therefore followers of God, as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given Himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, may the seed of your word fall upon fertile soils of our hearts, Lord. Lord, give us ears to hear that we would uh, receive your word and, uh, and do your word. And Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit this morning. God, that, uh, that your word would be as a, a fire shut up in my bones, Lord, and that I would preach your word, your truth, Lord, uh, the way that you would have me uh, to do, and that truth would be fully conveyed in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to start this off by describing for you a typical scene of a family conversation. Now, in this one, you know, I, I, I'm describing an event that happened. It's not a personal story. Okay? You'll notice this, you know, right away, you know, by, you know, by the, the people that are involved. The father and his favorite son are having a private meeting. The other family members are not included. They're talking about some things that they are intending to do and some things that they are making, uh, that they are making between one another. The mother is eavesdropping on the conversation. Uh, what she hears is not satisfactory to her at all. So she gathers, uh, gathers in her favorite son, the other one, and tells him what's going on between dad and the other boy. They devise a, a, a plot so that they can override what the father and that son are doing. In the course of the, uh, of the conversation and in the course of the events, the mother's favorite son deceives the father's favorite son and steals in, uh, his inheritance. The son, the one son, finds that his inheritance has been stolen. He is filled with anger and outrage at the matter. And he has, uh, he has made the threat that just as soon as the old man dies, he is going to kill his brother. A typical conversation, isn't it? Typical you know, thing that happens. The mother realizes that they have a serious situation on their hands. And so the mother... Uh, so the mother uh, sends the, uh, her boy away. She says, when this thing you know, kind of calms down a little bit, I'll send for you. The truth of the matter is that she never saw that boy again. Now, am I describing a family conversation that possibly could have taken you know, place here in Carlisville? No, actually, the truth of the matter is that I'm not. I'm actually describing a scene that took place 3,000 years ago. And it was recorded for us in the Bible. The family is the family of Isaac and Rebekah and their twin sons, Esau and Jacob. But it's an illustration of a typical family conversation. Now, I'm not going to go into this part, but if you want to understand, you know, uh, just a little bit of what's going on over in the Middle East with all that over there, read the story of Isaac, or sorry, of Esau and Jacob, and you'll begin to understand it. Because Jacob obviously would be Israel. And Esau is the, 
you know, Muslims, you know, the, the Palestinians over there. And uh, that actually goes, if you think that's just something that has happened during your lifetime or just maybe the past couple, it's been going on for the past 3,000 years. They've been fighting each other. But I'm not talking about that this morning. I'm just saying if you want a little bit more insight, that's where you, uh, that's where you should go and find that out. Communication, obviously, we know is like sharing is, uh, is sharing or exchanging information along with the emotions which accompany the information shared between individuals or groups uh, or, uh, or groups of individuals. When you communicate, you not only share what, uh, what you think about the matter, but you also share how you feel about the matter, right? Communication involves this process. You actually say something and you know uh, what you think uh, you are saying when you say it, what you say. Or what you yeah what you say, then others who are listening to uh, to you hear what you say, but they may hear what you say in a different way than it is intended for it to be heard. Then the uh, the people who heard you they respond on uh, to you on the basis of what they thought uh, they heard you say and how they felt about what they thought you were saying. Then you were uh, then you heard. Uh, sorry, then you hear what they say, but you may not know exactly what they meant when they said what you said. But you may, th- uh, you think maybe you do, and so you respond to uh, what you think may be said. Are you confused? Yes, sir. You should be. Because that's how the conversation goes. That's typically like how a conversation nowadays in the United States goes. Because why? Because somebody thinks that they heard something you know, a certain way, and then they only heard part of it, and then they heard this, and then they interpret it the way that they wanted you know, to interpret it, right? Without actually, That's one of the reasons why like, I would rather talk to you on a phone. I actually would rather talk to you in person than on a phone, but rather than a text message. Because I could sit there... I mean, it just feels really, feel, uh, to me it feels weird when I, like, do a text, and if you know me, there's, I have a little bit of sarcasm. I have to, like, and, and then, like, I, I put it on there, and I have to, like, put a little smiley face on there so they know that I'm kidding. Or a little JK for just kidding. Or LOL. If you don't know what you know, those mean, then, you know, you could talk to anybody, you know, just talk to a younger person, they probably know what those words mean. But anyway, but that's the whole thing is, is that most people nowadays, they hear something from, uh, you know, that they're hearing from somebody else, that they're hearing from somebody else, that they're hearing from somebody else, and they don't ever actually go back to the original source, right? Because they, you know, they're like, I don't care. Most of the time, you know, that's, that's also the uh, subject of what they call clickbait nowadays, which is basically you see something on somebody's Facebook page, you see a headline, you never read the article, you just read the headline, and then you react to it, right? That's how a lot of things go. Most people nowadays don't feel like they have time to actually figure out what you're actually saying. And how many of you like to be, when you find out that that conversation has gone farther, but it's not the conversation that was originally had? How many of you love that situation? You go, man, I, I love the fact that people are misquoting me all over the place. I don't see anybody raising their hand, so I'm guessing that nobody likes that at all, Right? But that's typically what happens, you know, in a family is those same things. It's those same situations. We could say something. We intend something differently. Like there's times where I've said something to my family, meaning one thing, and I almost had to do the emoji thing, like say with my wife and say, I was kidding. And she goes, oh, I, I, I didn't think you were kidding by the, you know, the tone in your voice. So it's a matter of how it's being interpreted. Not saying that I'm right in the fact you know, that you know, that's how she took it because I probably should have checked how I said it. But I'm saying like, that's how things can get misconstrued. So obviously, we've learned uh, obviously, you know, a lot you know, that, that the glue of the family is commitment. We have to be committed to each other no matter what. That you're family no matter what. That you're committed to staying together no matter what, Right? That when a man and a woman come together to form a family, that they are joined together permanently. It's not this mindset of, oh, I think I can do, the, you know, like, I, oh, I think I got it wrong. Well, you got it wrong, and you better try to make it right. Commitment is the glue that holds us together. It is the glue which ties a family together. But the oil of a family is communication. That's how things work. That's how things move, right? 
It is the oil which makes things run smoothly in the family. It is the oil of conversation and communication which helps us to relate to one another effectively and to say things we want to say in the way we want to say them. I say this, you know, as... um, you know, uh, the fact that I'm going to try today to obviously to talk about the, obviously the family uh, conversation and, uh, and that whole communication thing, but I have one major liability. I'm a man. Let's just put it this way. Men are not good, real good, when it comes to communication in the family. I was hoping to hear an amen on that one, but you know, got really quiet. All the men were like, I ain't admitting it. Because then my wife knows that I know that I can't communicate well. So in the 46 years that I've tried to communicate to my family, whether it be my parents at home and my brother, you know, when I was growing up, or, you know, when I first got married, you know, uh, to Alicia, trying to communicate those things, and then, you know, and then, we, you know, we had Lily. All those things, all in that entire thing, I'll just, I'll just tell you this, that I still haven't gotten it right, and then you could probably put it this way, that I'm a slow learner. And so I'm going to do my best to try, uh, uh, to try and take what I have learned and try and pass it on to you. And some of these things, you know, I'm still learning as I'm going through it. I can say I know them. Yes, I know them, but am I doing them? Right? There's a lot of things that we know to do, but do we actually do them, right? So we, we've heard the, you know, the surveys that talk about marriages that, that, most, you know, that most marriages, do, uh, that 86% of marriages, uh, sorry, 86% of marriages that have ended in divorce was a breakdown in communication. Most people simply don't know how to communicate. We know that there's a 50-50 shot that, you know, nowadays that a marriage makes it, right? That they don't get divorced. But they say out of those that was 50% that get divorced, 86% of them is because there is a breakdown in communication. So that's probably a big, uh, that is probably a big problem, don't you think? So often when a, a couple is engaged and getting ready to marry, one of the main things which they seem to have with one another is the ability to talk and communicate, don't they? They just love each other. Oh. And they'll just sit there and look at each other and they're like, oh, he's just so amazing. Oh, she's amazing. They're the best. I can just talk to them about everything, right? And they'll go back and forth. And, you know, we just love being together. We just stay up late at night and talking on the phone. And I just, just feel so free and open with, you know, him or her. I use this example because when, you know, Alicia and I, before we were dating, we would talk on the phone until like 2 o'clock in the morning. I mean, that's the only way we could communicate because I was in Illinois and she was in Missouri. That's how we were. We just sit there and talk. We weren't dating because we didn't date until five years later. If you don't know that story, it was not by my choice. All right. I could say that now because I'm up here and I have the microphone and she's down there, you know. It wasn't, you know, I could say that it wasn't by my choice, but it was for the best. Let's just put it that way. But it's, you know, they'll look at it and say, it's just marvelous, everything else. And you have these people come out and they're like, oh, we're just soulmates. Nothing could ever, ever change that. We connect with one another. We're just so compatible. But then when uh, difficulties come, and unfortunately when marriages do not make it, you begin to hear things like, we just didn't understand one another. We just didn't talk with one another anymore. Somehow we just couldn't seem to talk to one another anymore. So you went from telling that person everything to saying, you know, I can't even talk to him now, right? And that's what ends up. So from there, there's something that happens in marriages that sabotages the whole matter of communication. And sometimes there is something that happens in families which hinders families from communicating with one another uh, the, way, uh, the way that they want to. And I have chosen, obviously, Ephesians chapter 4 and part of uh, chapter 5 to talk to you about how to have a family talk because I think it is one of the clearest passages in the entire Bible on the subject of communication. There are many kinds of communication. There's the communication of time. When you spend time with a person, you are communicating concern and uh, and care and interest in them. There's communication of gifts. 
when you give somebody something, you are communicating with them, right? There is communication of touch. When you touch someone, you are communicating with them. But I'm thinking, you know, primarily uh, today in the terms of communicating with words. Uh, When you read what these verses have to say about words and the importance of communicating words, you uh, learn some uh, some crucial principles about how to have a family talk. When was the last time that you sat together with your family and had a good talk? No TV. I say that because oftentimes the TV is one of the biggest things that comes in uh, in the place. You're like, we spent time together, and that most in you, you know we spent we spent five hours you know uh, the other day together, and probably four and a half of those was watching TV. Right? That's how sometimes that happens. I'm not the only one in the room. I know that. But when's the last time you just sat around and you have a good time? And the thing is that sometimes it can be really hard to have that conversation, especially if that's what you're used to, is all of the time talking or you're watching TV. It could, you could just be sitting and you're like, you know what, we're going to turn off the TV and we're just going to have a good talk. And you'll sit, sometimes you'll sit there and it's kind of awkward because you're like, okay, what do we talk about? And so you have that. And sometimes you know, what ends up happening is like, hey, you remember what happened on that show that we watched the other day, you know, when you allowed us to watch TV? Because somehow or another, as a parent, you're going to be the evil person, right? You're going to be that evil person that turned off the good TV. Honestly, the good TV can, you know, could be turned off a lot more. It needs to be turned off a lot more. So what do we, you know, if we're going to, you know, if we're going to hear one another, we gotta, we got to do some things. So, so number one is this, we need to eliminate some problems. We need to eliminate some problems. There are some problems which must be eliminated from the whole uh, matter of communication if we are going to talk with one another the way we should. So let's move down through the verses here and eliminate some of those problems. If you look at verse 25, what does it say? Wherefore, putting away lying. If you have to, elim- uh, you have to eliminate dishonest elements, you have to eliminate lying. And that includes you know, a little white lies, or I just stretched the truth, or I, you know, it was not a lie, it was a fib. They're all lying, right? Lies in the family are, are the termites, uh, termites of trust. When you lie to your mate or to your children or your parents, these lies become termite, uh, termites that eat away at trust. I taught this, you know, to my daughter, so something that was taught to me as well. My parents always said, you know what? You know, we trust you 100% until you lie. I say, if you tell us the truth, for one thing, your punishment's going to be less if you tell us the truth. If you lie, it's going to be far worse. And it's harder to get somebody's trust back than it is, you know, harder to get you know, that trust back after you've got done lying, right? Lies can be lethal to, uh, to the fam- uh, in a family. When, uh, when you speak lies and when you deal uh, with your family on the basis of lies, it, is a, it, is, it can be deadly to the family. I mean, according to the Bible, we're all born liars. Psalm 58 verse 3 says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born speaking lies. So we are born with what? A sinful nature, right? We are, we are born knowing how to tell lies. You don't necessarily have to teach a child how to lie, do you? It's just kind of there, isn't it? They may not know that it's wrong, because that's why you're there to teach them that it's wrong. Unfortunately, many liars simply improve with age. You have to learn to eliminate lying. You have to take away, uh, with to take away these things that are not pleasing and these things that ought not to be said. You must commit yourself to honesty, no matter how hard it hurts. Sometimes telling the truth hurts, doesn't it? You're like, you know what, it would be so much easier if I could just lie about this and whatever. No, because we talked about it before. Once you tell a lie, you have to keep lying in order to keep going, right? If you tell the truth, you don't have to... Eat. And you don't have to remember. If you tell the truth, you don't have to remember where you're, because you started off with the truth. You're there with the truth. But if you start off with a lie, you've got to tell another lie, to tell another lie, to tell another lie, to tell another lie. And you've got to always remember all those lies or else you're going to get yourself in a situation, right? 
The second element that you have to eliminate is found in verse 29. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Not only do you have to eliminate dishonest elements in family talks, but you also have to eliminate those distasteful elements, these uh, corrupt communications. Oftentimes, people look at this verse and they say, automatically, this is cussing and swearing. That's what that means. Yeah, that is not good communication, right? It is not the best, you know, it's not the best. You know, when I used to swear, I'll tell you this, there were certain words that I liked. And the the reason why is because I didn't want to actually think about what I was saying. I just wanted to say that because I knew that if, if I used a certain word, the other person would just know it anyways. They're like, you know what I'm talking about. You're like, if I say that, you know, this, this, and this, and this, with an expletive at the end, you know what I'm referring to, you know, right? That's what, you know, the reason why I would do it. I didn't want to think. But if we actually, you know, were to put, you know, that part away and say, you know what, I'm going to actually tell people what I'm thinking, it may take an extra second for me to do it, but I'm going to let them know, you know, so I don't have to, you know, uh, use that kind of communication. That's part of, you know, that's a good thing, right? But the word corrupt is a word that was used to refer to overripe, uh, overripe fruit or rotten fish. So think about that, overripe, in other words, rotten fruit, rotten fish. Mm, can you smell it now? There are some elements of corrupt communication that we have to get out of the family conversations. There is a process of corrupt communication that happens in the family. The process is like this. Sometimes it starts with complaining. Nobody in here complains, I know that. Nobody in here. Except for myself at times. There's a place, you know, for the registering le- legitimate complaints. You could tell somebody that, hey, you have a complaint in the family, right? But most of us, however, find a sore and we pick at it, hoping for a reaction. Don't we? At other times, it's complaining that is attached to blame. We complain about it and then we start blaming the person, right? It moves from complaining to criticism. Start criticizing them. We begin to criticize the other members of the family, and we, uh, you begin to hear words like this. You never can do anything right. You are always like that. Why are you so prone to make mistakes like that? And what mo- you're moving into a critical mode. And here, you know, by the way, no one ever, never, or always does something. Do you understand that? That no one ever, never, or always does something. You always do this. Do they always do that? No. You never put your clothes away. You can't think of one time that they actually did, then you can't use the word never there, right? And then after that, it moves into contempt. Then the person begins to have contempt for other members in the family. You hear things like this You're so stupid, you're so dumb. How can you be so ugly? This is all corrupt communication. We're not even, I haven't even got to, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, the fact of swearing. I'm talking about the fact of stuff that is not edifying, obviously. It is not building up anyone. It is destroying the other person, right? This stuff is uh, is the stuff that needs to be eliminated from our relationships with one another. It doesn't just go with the family. It also goes with the church family, right? It even goes you know, you know, beyond that, but we're focusing right now on the family. Not only does it say that we are, that we are to eliminate lying, and uh, not only does it say that we are to eliminate corrupt communication, but look at verse 31. It talks about some other dangerous elements that need to be eliminated. Verse 31, let all bitterness be put away. Bitterness is anger turned in. It refers to a bitter root that produces a bitter fruit, Right? Whatever you plant is what you get. I know Matt can say this. I know that you know, Doc can say this. And Jay, he's out there. They don't go out there planting corn and expecting you know, uh, pineapples. Right? Whatever you plant is what you get. I mean, I'm not you know, a farmer. You know, my wife is you know, obviously the, you know, more of the gardener than I am. And she goes out there and she plants stuff. And she plant, what she plants, she plans on getting, right? She plants t- tomatoes. She wants tomatoes. You know, she's not hoping for avocados out of that, out of that plant. It would be really strange. 
This stuff right here, you know, that, that bitter fruit is a poison to the family, which can, uh, which can become bitter and let all bitter, and all, that bitterness interferes with our family. Be, uh, beware bitterness, uh, you know, beware of bitterness, be, uh, but we uh, must also avoid wrath. The word wrath, because it talks about it there, it, it says the word wrath mean, uh, means like an explosion or something is poured out, right? It means an eruption. We get, you know, this word we actually, you know, get from thermos or thermonuclear from it. Now think about those words, thermos or thermonuclear. There are some families that, uh, that there's a person who blows up the quickest and the person who makes the biggest scene is the one who wins the argument. The Bible says that you are to eliminate that. And that even includes, because this is you know, something that I do, I'll tell you this, is that I may, it's not the fact of being quick on it, it may be something that I've been holding back and holding back, I haven't said anything because, you know, just holding it, holding it, holding it, holding it, and then all of a sudden one day it just blows up. And that's not good either. You say, well, you're showing self-control that entire time. No, I was letting it fester. I wasn't letting that go either. Instead of like taking that, keeping my mouth shut and like letting the Lord deal with me on that and letting, you know, get that out of there, I just kept it. I was just storing it up, adding more dynamite to the situation. The next word that we're going to see on this whole entire thing is, you know, uh, that we have to eliminate is anger. Obviously, this word means, you know, it talks about a rising anger, and it literally means to become red-faced. I've never met a person who is angry that has not had their face turn red. I mean, I see some pretty calm, angry people, but their face still turns red, no matter what. It is the idea of someone holding onto their anger as it grows and grows. It is a picture of, ri- of rising anger. It is a picture of brooding over things and allowing them to take root in your heart. The next one that we need to eliminate is clamor. That word means loud speaking. It refers to shouting. In some families, the one who talks the loudest is the, family, uh, is the one in the family who wins that argument. We kind of talked about that you know, a little bit here already. The one who uh, can shout the most is the one who subdues all, all the rest of the family because probably the family's going, okay, you know what? We'll just be quiet so you shut up. To be honest, I mean, that's, that's pretty much what happens, right? And that's not always the parents, is it? I've heard kids pitch fits, you know, yelling, shouting, and everything else, telling, I mean, calling their parents all kinds of things. That's what the Bible refers to as clamor. And the parents are just sitting there quietly. Then it mentions evil speaking. It talks about uh, evil speaking. This phrase refers to uh, injurious language, causing injuries. It's an attempt to hurt the other person with with your words. And whoever came up with the saying of sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, obviously has never had anything, you know, bad said to them, right? Because words hurt more than sticks and stones, Right? This oftentimes happens when we talk down to people, when we say hurtful things to others, when we use words to wound. We must be careful to speak, oh, sorry, when we speak in anger. We will say things that we would normally never say otherwise. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Obviously, if there's death and life in the power of the tongue, life is going to bring life. Death is going to bring death, right? It's going to injure. It's going to hurt. If you are going to hear another one, we, you know, this is an, you know, number two. After we eliminate those problems, we need to integrate some principles. You need to integrate some basic principles in your family talk. Look at verse 25. It says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak truth with his neighbor. You, are, uh, you say that's talking about neighbors. That's like my next door neighbor, right? But literally the word neighbor means one who lives near another. You don't live any closer to the people that you do inside your own house. Those are your neighbors. 
Those are your neighbors. Yes, there's you know, your next door neighbors that you have or whatever, but your closest neighbors are the ones that are under the same roof as you. You build families on truthfulness, speaking truth. Somebody says, you know, uh, you know, uh, somebody says, you know what, you know what, Pastor, you're hitting right on there. I just, I just tell it like it is. I just speak truth. I don't, you know, whatever. And it's in the manner that you speak it. If you look at verse 15 of chapter 4 in Ephesians, it says this, but speaking the truth in love. Some people claim they are being truthful when the matter, the truth of the matter is that they are being brutal. You can be cruel with truth. You can speak truth and yet be mean and cruel and brutal to the other person. So it's not a matter of the fact of you being you know, just truthful, it's how you say it. And why would you say it to the person who uh, you know, like that and wanting to injure the person if that's the person who lives under the same roof as you, Right? Because oftentimes, the reason why we say stuff to the people that are under, our, uh, under the same roof as us, we say it in brutal ways, is because of the fact that they're the closest to us, and we feel like, you know what, they're just going to forgive me anyways. Well, they know what I mean. You know, they know that I didn't mean anything bad by that. They understood me. I had to say the truth because, you know what, they needed to hear it. That, the problem with that is the how you're saying and you're not, so you're not speaking the truth in love, right? Let's turn over to uh, Deuteronomy chapter uh, 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. The Bible uh, reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and, uh, and thou, shalt love, uh, thou, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words, which I command you uh, thee this day, uh, shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto uh, thy children, and shalt uh, talk of them when thou sit, uh, sittest, in, uh, sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and then when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon the, uh, thine hand, and, upon, uh, and thou shalt uh, put a frontlets between thine eyes. Verse 9, and thou shalt write them upon the, the post of thy door and on thy gates. What we need to realize, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, I know it's been you know, a while since we talked about this, this right here is a beautiful Old Testament pattern and an image of the family altar. This is the family altar. This is a good pattern to follow is the fact that there, are, there should be a time when we sit down with our families, open up the word of God, and share the truth with those in our homes. We should take, time, uh, take the time to pray together and seek God as a family. We must talk about the Lord to our families. We must, talk, uh, we must talk to the Lord about our families, right? We can't just tell our family about the Lord. We also need to talk to the Lord and say, you know what? Help my, you know, help, you know, my sister, you know, she's having this. Or help my brother, help my wife, help whoever it is in your family. Because the Lord already knows, but he wants to hear from you. Those things that are important, you're going to bring up to him, right? So mom and dad, your sons and daughters are, you know, obviously in school, and they are going to into a, co- a culture that is hostile to everything that you and I believe. It's hostile towards these. Well, my child is only—you know—they're only in nursery school. They're even at that age. There are kids, and there are environments, and everything else that are already hostile towards them in what they believe. And it is it obviously it's going to be hostile to the Bible, hostile to the church. It's going to be hostile to the Lord Jesus Christ. All the powers of hell have assailed. You know, have come after young people of this country, right? How can, you, uh, how can we imagine sending them out into that world until we have first filled them with the truth of God? How can we send them off into that environment if we have not prayed with them, if we have not shared God's word with them, if we have not prayed over them and talked to the Lord, uh, you know, uh, you know, talk to the Lord about them, right? And we uh, must pray for God, obviously God's, uh, pray for God's protective hand to be upon them. Put God's truth in your family. 
the truth of the Word of God. Before they go out, before they go to school, set that time apart. You know what that's going to require? It's going to require you waking up a little bit earlier and helping, you know, helping them get ready faster. And I know sometimes when you got kids, that's a chore right there, trying to get them you know, all, you know, ready to go faster because oftentimes they have one speed and that's not fast. There are several levels of communication in a family. And by the way, like, there's sometimes when somebody comes into church and they're like, I'm so sorry, I'm late, I'm whatever. And they got like, you know, two, three kids, you know, whatever. And the wife has got to get her husband ready together, you know, and all that. And they're like, she's like, I'm so sorry that I'm late. And they're like, you know, still like, I mean, they're like five minutes late. I'm like, I'm just glad that you decided that you wanted to come. Because you've had to like put all this together and you're still here. Praise the Lord. Right? So don't ever sit there and think, you know, like I come out there and say, hey, I'm, that's why, you know, when you come in and, you, you know, if you say that, I say, you know what, I'm just glad that you're here. Because I am. Because you could have said, you know what, forget it. They're moving at one speed. I'm just going to stay home. But you said, no, we're going to go to the house of the Lord today, right? Amen. There are several, level, several levels of communication in a family. Not only do you have to have truthfulness, but let's look back at verse 29. The negative side of communication is let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. So the positive side, uh, the positive side of communication is, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. That's the positive side of it, is that what you're saying is, you know, uh, that instead of corrupt communication, you're going to let, you know, whatever comes out of your mouth be edifying, build up the other person, encouraging them. Th that means that we are not only to be truthful in our family conversations, but we are also to be sure to include the element of kindness, that which is good for the use of edifying, right? We are to be kind to one another. And I can hear some of the kids, you know, saying this, because this is, you know, uh, one of the things, as a, uh, and I wasn't a Christian growing up. My mom would actually, you know, tell us, you know, be kind to your brother. I said, I was being kind. I only punched him once. That's not a good thing. That's not what I'm talking about. Talking about being kind does not mean, like, hitting or punching or saying something bad. Like, I could have said this, but I didn't, you know. That's not kindness. Be kind to them. We've got to have those family altars, right? Because the thing is that oftentimes those things that we pray for, if we pray for those people that we have those arguments with, oftentimes we're going to be nicer to them, aren't we? Because people that we pray for, we care about. The people that we pray for, we care about. We have a concern for, right? We must bring the truth of God into our homes. We must pray for His power and His presence to be upon us as we live in this world. But we also must learn how to communicate as we keep uh, going through this. There are times that we must deal with issues that arise throughout our family. We must learn to handle those uh, issues properly. So in other words, when something comes up that out of the blue and it could be something that has caught you completely off guard and you're in a frantic and, and, uh, and everything else and you may be like this person, when you, something comes out of the blue and you're frantic, oftentimes you start getting short in the way that you talk to the other person, right? But what you, know, uh, what you, need, to, you know, uh, what you need to do is say, you know what, hold on a second, give me a minute and then, you know, uh, give that, then here's the other thing, you must give that person a minute don't sit there and keep on asking them because that's not going to help the situation. So you give them a minute so they can collect their thoughts and think about these things, and then they can come back and try to talk about it more rationally about what just happened, right? Whatever that situation is and however to do it. And you know what the thing is? Is we got to learn how to uh, fix the problem and not start pointing the blame. Don't always be looking for the person to blame for the problem. It's not my fault. That was their fault. They did it don't need that. Learn how to fix the problem and not sit there and say, you know what, and, and start pointing the blame. Learn to fix that problem and say, how can we take care of this instead of going, well, you know what, it's all my wife's fault. It's all her fault. If she would have done what I asked her to do, this would have never happened. Because you know how well that conversation is going to go. Because if you have that conversation with your wife, you say, it's all your fault. And if you do, how many of you know that, you know, it's, you're not going to be, you know, running through a, a field of daisies and daffodils going, oh, this is a wonderful conversation I'm having. No, all of a sudden, it's going to turn into a shouting match, and it's never going to turn out well, right? 
because you're causing the other person to be angry too. You're not only angry, you're causing, you're causing that thing to spread as it goes through. We ought to realize that everyone is precious to God. God has given you that family, and every member deserves to be listened to, deserves to be respected, and deserves to be heard. Listen one to another and focus on the problem, not the person. Focus on the problem and not the person. Sometimes in family meetings, you have to use two strategies. Sometimes, you know, people, I've heard people using different objects of saying, you know, when this person has this object, you know, say a stick. When this person has a stick, they're the ones talking. Everybody else is to be quiet. All right? And so sometimes people use that. So, but obviously, um, you have to, you know, you have to pass that around so everyone is able to be heard in that situation. But now, like for most of us men, when we hear a problem, we have an immediate solution, don't we? We want to fix it. Am I the only one that wants to fix it every time that, you know, I hear a problem? I'm right there. But there are times when we just need to hold the bucket or hold the stick and just, or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, or just hold our, our tongue and just sit there and go, and just keep our mouth shut, Right? Because it's not, we don't always need to fix things. That's in our nature. We want to fix everything, but sometimes we need to do what? Is to keep our mouth shut and be able to listen to what's going on. We need to let them, you know, you need to let the other person just say, you know, like just throw up everything that, they, that they've been going through, right? Just, say, you know, how their day's been going, all that kind of stuff to go on there. Instead of trying to fix it, just let them say what they're going to say. I would have you turn there, but, you know, uh, James chapter 1, verse 19 says this. Wherefore, my brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. That's what we need to do. Is that swift means that, uh, that we are a good listener, right? That we must learn to listen. When somebody in the family wants to tell you something, you have to learn to listen and look at them. This is oftentimes it's something different. Difficult for children is the fact that, especially if you're having a conversation about correction, they don't want to look at you. When you're listening to somebody, you look at them, you know, as well. So your ears listen, and then you, you look at, at them as well. Obviously, you know, we talked about eliminating some problems, integrating some principles. But finally, we need to appropriate some promises or to set apart or to assign to a particular use some of these promises that we see in these verses. As I went, you know, uh, went and studied these verses, I found that every member of the Trinity is mentioned in this portion of Scripture. In verse 30, you have the mention of God of the Holy Spirit. And, it says, and, grieve, uh, and then it says, uh, so God the Holy Spirit says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit. God the Father shows up in verse 32, and, uh, and we find that God the Son is mentioned in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. The presence of the, Holy, uh, presence of the Trinity should give us encouragement as we seek to govern our families according to the Word of God. But praise, you know, praise God, we, all, we, we have all the help that we need uh, to do what we have been called to do, right? We can do everything. Why? Because the Lord is with us, on, uh, Lord is with us as we go. In verse 32, the Bible speaks of God the Father. It says, even as God, for Christ's sake, uh, sake has or hath forgiven you. Now think about that. The power of God, uh, God the Father is this, that, you know what, as he has forgiven you, you need to forgive others, right? How much has the Lord forgiven you? A lot, right? We need to have that same for the other person, that we need, uh, we need to forgive them. Why? Because Christ has forgiven us. In, uh, in, in uh, Ephesians 5, 2, it talks about, obviously, God the Son, Jesus Christ. says, walk in love as Christ has loved us and has given himself for us. We have the peace of Christ in our families when we learn to communicate like him. How did Jesus speak? He spoke the language of love. You say, well, there's times where he threw over tables. Sometimes those things happen is the fact that, you know, if our, our, our communication is rightly focused, then that you know, needs what to happen. Because sometimes we need to show people, you know what, you're not listening, so you know what, I, I have to go uh, to a deeper level on that one. 
His, his love caused him to do what for us? He caused, us, it caused him to go to the cross for us. Your family needs large doses, uh, large doses of love in every area of your life together. That love is yours. If you know Jesus, you, you must learn how to give it out liberally, right? If you have Jesus Christ in your heart and you have that love, you need to, uh, you know, uh, to, to pour that out upon, uh, you know, upon those that are around you. One last story, and I close with this. A woman went to a counselor. She was very upset at her husband. She said, I am tired of that man. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to divorce that man, but I'm not going to just divorce him. I'm going to destroy him, and I want you to tell me how to do it. The counselor said, I'll tell you what you do. If you not only want to divorce him, but destroy him in the process, you go home and act as everything is fine. All you do is you, you praise him and honor him and are responsive to, uh, responsive to him. You know, maybe cook him his favorite meals. Tell him how wonderful he is. Tell him that he is your hero. Tell him that he is your everything. Do this for several days, and then finally, when you've got him right in the, where you want him, hit him. Hit him where it hurts and tell him that you want to, you want to divorce him. And absolutely take him for everything that he has. He won't have a thin dime when you're, uh, when you're through with him. She said, I'll do that. Several months went by and he didn't hear from her. So the counselor decided to call her and he said, are you, uh, are you about ready for that divorce? She said, what divorce? I married the most wonderful man in the world. Who would want to divorce him? You might be surprised when, you know, what a little praise and a little respect and a little love might do in your family, right? How we talk, how we communicate with one another says volumes to the world around us as well, right? We need to learn how to show that respect, you know, not use that corrupt you know, language and stuff that's going to tear down others, right? We need to sit there and, and speak the truth in love. One of the best things that we could ever do for our families is learn to communicate with one another. We need to learn to, uh, to express our feelings and concerns in the, in the right manner. That's okay to you know, tell somebody how you feel, but you need to do it in the right way. We need to uh, learn to communicate with our families about the Lord. When you discipline your child, say you give them a spanking or a whooping or anything else, let them know why. Because if they don't know why, they're just like, I'm just getting a whooping for whatever. And, you know, oftentimes, they, they'll sit there and, and wonder, what, you know, they may know that they were doing wrong. But I can guarantee by the time you get to them, they already forgot about it. So you need to let them know the reason why you're disciplining them that way and why it's helping them and why you're correcting them. Because it's not going to help if you just go over there and give them a whooping and send them to their room and tell them to think about it, Right? Because right now, the only thing, that, you know, when they're in their bedroom thinking about it, the only thing they're going is, how do I get out of this bedroom without my parents killing me? Right? We need to learn to communicate with our families about the Lord and what he is doing in our lives. We need to learn to listen to one another, respect one another, love one another in the right ways for the glory of God, right? So my question to you today is this. How are your communication skills? Could you or your family benefit from a time of talking to the Lord about how you could be better communicators. I want you to look at your spouse, look at your children, look at your, you know, if you have extended family with you, look at your church family. I want you to know they deserve your love, your attention, and your ear. Do you think it's time we simply learn to communicate with one another. So my challenge for you, obviously, is those questions is, do you think, you know, could you, you and your family benefit from a time of talking to the Lord about how you could be better communicators? 
Because you can't lie to the Lord. You're not supposed to do that anyways, right? When we look around at those in this room, you may have your family with you, you have your church family with you. Remember, they deserve your love, your attention, and your respect. 